for inviting me. Um, you might have noticed, and especially uh, the Swedish colleagues here, that um, the, your neighbors from the Norwegian government have introduced an uh, aviation tax, if I'm correct, on the 1st of June 2016, equal to 80 Norwegian kroner and about 9, nine euros um, uh, per flight, uh, flight ticket. Um, and of course, from a consumer welfare perspective, you might assume that airlines pass through part of this aviation tax to the passenger. So uh, Norwegian, uh, Norwegians are going to pay more for air travel. There will be some diversion to other transport modes. Some people might decide not to travel anymore. And some of them even might use a Swedish airport. And you might expect from that air travel tax, from a consumer perspective, that there are some negative consumer welfare losses uh, attached. <laughs> and you can calculate that. However, Ryanair recently decided in response to the, to the Norwegian aviation tax that it would close its Oslo Ruge base. About 16 routes over there to various European destinations. And when we think away those 16 routes, when we take into account the, the supply response of Ryanair, there will be much more com uh, um, implications for the Norwegian air traveler. Uh, it might travel longer to, to its final destination, may not benefit from these great discounts that Ryanair is, uh, is offering. So uh, this Ryanair response might trigger, um, might leverage the initial consumer uh, impacts that, that, that we found in our initial uh, calculation. And that's a bit of the, the, the central message um, for, for today, is that generally when we look at um, consumer welfare impacts within a CBA, the focus, at least in aviation, is mostly on, on those first order effects. But airlines respond. And airlines, due to the nature of the industry, have some difficulties of continuously adjusting capacity to demand because airline capacity is quite lumpy. You have limited flexibility of adapting aircraft size and frequency. So this might result, airline responses might result in route closures, in closures of operating bases, of rationalization of transfer hubs, and these kind of second or order impacts, especially at the individual market level or the individual airport level, can be quite substantial and they might leverage your initial demand effects and your initial consumer welfare impacts. And my message is that policymakers and regulators should at least be aware of these potential second order effects. Um, that it's important to address them qualitatively and if you can, quantitatively. Um, I'm not going to present a holy grail uh, today of calculating all those second order uh, impacts, but I do present a model which we call the hub network rationalization model that takes part, that takes into account part of the supply responses to policy interventions. Um, and which may help to reduce a bit the uncertainty on on the supplier, uh, on the supplier side. Um, and we do that by simulating um, airline responses um, to, for example, cost increases or uh, deregulation of aviation markets, increases in competition, changes in airport charges. What I will do is, is first go briefly to, to things that will be m very familiar to most of you, consumer welfare impacts, then I go to airline supply responses. I will take you through the hub network rationalization model. We'll do a brief case study on, on Amsterdam and then come to some policy recommendations. CBA and consumer welfare impacts. Um, investments in aviation infrastructure as well, well as policy interventions, regulatory measures are, as we see, increasingly assessed with cost benefit analysis. And I must say, when, when we look at the different analysis, it's more the evaluation of investments in airport infrastructure than it is um, on regulation or, or policy measures. 
Um, you can think of deregulation of, of aviation markets, uh, the introduction of aviation taxes, charges, caps on airport capacity. Um, but it's definitely less widespread than the application of cost-benefit analysis in terms of investments in aviation infrastructure. And depending on the, on, on the topic we're dealing with, um, the direct consumer welfare impact to consumer surplus is in general a, an important part of the equation. And it all relates to the changes in travel costs, as we know, in a policy scenario compared to a reference scenario. It, as well as the change in demand, market generation, market degeneration. Um, more specifically, it relates to the changes in all the conveniences that the traveler experiences for, for getting from A to B. The change in the generalized travel costs, which are basically the out-of-pocket cost, your ticket fare and evaluation of time. For example, when we look at the generalized travel cost for, for an air trip, we can distinguish between the time cost, the out-of-pocket cost and your frequency uh, costs. Um, when you travel from uh, Paris Charles de Gaulle to, to Singapore and you take the Air France direct flight from Paris Charles de Gaulle to, uh, to, 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 uh, to Singapore, you have a certain in-flight time and you value that in-flight time. As a business passenger, you do differently than a leisure passenger. But if you're looking for the bargain and you travel Emirates through Dubai, you also spend time in the aircraft, a little bit longer, and you spend a few hours transferring at Dubai. You may dislike that, waiting at Dubai, there's a value of travel time associated, so we have your, uh, you have your time cost component of the generalized travel costs. When we would include access and egress uh, time cost, you would need to add that as well, uh, as well. When you do a door-to-door -door, um, analysis, the region of Stockholm to the region of, uh, of Singapore, you need to take into account egress and access costs as well. Then we have the out-of-pocket costs, your airfare, traveling from Paris to Singapore, you pay for a return ticket, maybe 800 euros, out-of-pocket costs. When you take into account door-to-door -door, uh, travel, you need to, to, to take into account access and egress, egress costs as well. And we have a frequency component. And frequency, in particular for the business passenger, represents a certain value. Frequency represents flexibility. So your actual departure time is closer to your desired departure time when the frequency uh, is higher. So that adds up to the frequency cost. Might also include reliability here, but I think that these are three very important elements of all the conveniences a passenger or a consumer uh, faces when traveling, for example, from Paris, um, Charles de Gaulle to, uh, to Singapore. Very straightforward, you can do that in your, your policy scenario, you can do that in a kind of reference uh, scenario which you, when you would not uh, implement uh, the policy calculate your, your changes in demand, changes in your generalized travel cost, and derive your welfare impacts. Now, many ways to do that. Um, at, uh, at SEO, we, we, we use our what we call our net cost model um, to estimate those changes in consumer welfare. It estimates changes in the generalized travel cost, in total demand in the market, in demand distribution over different travel options, and your changes in consumer welfare. And what it basically does, when we take again the Paris to Singapore market, is identify first all the travel options in the market. And note, the airline industry is a networked industry. Uh, so we need to look at both the direct travel options, non-stop, Paris, Charles de Gaulle, to Singapore, as well as all the indirect travel options, uh, for example, with the transfer in Dubai. And then we measure all the inconveniences, the generalized travel cost to get from your initial origin to your final destination, in a base case and in a policy scenario. Very straightforward. And that net cost then estimates changes in your generalized travel cost, the total passenger demand, because be when it becomes e when there are less inconveniences, when it becomes cheaper to travel to Singapore, you generate market demand, the market will get bigger. Uh, the distribution of the demand will change over various travel options um, and we'll have a consumer welfare impact. Well, here it is, the Paris Shell to go to Singapore market. And what Netcos Netcos does is it identifies the Paris Shell in, in the market, all the different travel options. 
So we have here the airport codes, Charles de Gaulle to Singapore, and these are the both the, the two direct routes in the market. Um, one route operated by SkyTeam, which is Air France, and one by Star, which is Singapore Airlines. We have both serve the market seven times a week with a certain number of seats, with a certain fare, um, with certain time cost, certain schedule delay, and total generalized travel cost. And from here, we can derive a distribution of demand over the different travel options when we also take into account all the indirect travel options. For example, uh, the option via Cairo um, or Zurich or Munich. And of course, you have to calibrate this on real market data, which we regularly do. So we take passenger booking data and try to, to get as close as possible to, to the real choices that passengers make. And with, with such a net cost model, you, you can estimate consumer welfare changes uh, as a result of certain policy interventions. Imagine a European country, a hy hypothetical European country, that has a bilateral air service agreement with a non-European country. And in that bilateral air service agreement, the carriers from both, country, both countries, from the European country and from the third country, as we call it, have the right to fly seven times a week between, two, between the two countries. They're free to set capacity and fares, but they are limited to seven frequencies a week, which is quite representative, I think, for a restricted bilateral air service agreement. There are two carriers, one from the European country, one from the third country. They operate a hub in their own home countries. And the carrier from the third country applies for additional traffic rights. In other words, it wants to fly more. It wants to double its frequency between the European country and the third country. Now, the European country asks, well, we want to evaluate the consumer welfare impacts of those additional frequencies in the market. When we would allow the third country carrier to fly more to our country, what is going to happen with consumer welfare? Well, you can use that net cost model, the general travel cost calculation, to estimate the impact on demand, on the distribution over different travel options, and finally, consumer welfare. And here we see what is going to happen. So the third country carrier is, was operating 365 times per year. It adds 365 flights in that year, adding up to 730 flights um, uh, in total. Originally, the carrier transported about 150,000 passengers a year. When it doubles the frequency, might use smaller aircraft type um, for that frequency, but it adds about 60,000 passengers um, to its own market. Um, those are not only passengers traveling from the European country to the third country, but also beyond, with a transfer via the hub in the third country uh, to somewhere else in the world. And it's also a bit market generation, because when there are more frequencies, when there's more choice in the market, maybe in certain markets more competition and low affairs, you stimulate the market, so more people start to travel. So we see more passengers for that third country carrier when it doubles its frequency, but on the other hand, the European carrier sees its market decline by uh, almost 30,000 passengers a year. Sees its market decline with almost 30,000 passengers a year. And using that, that, that generalized travel cost modeling, we see that for the residents in the European country, there is a, in the first year a welfare, consumer welfare impact of almost 10 million euro, and for all travelers in the market of about 20 million euro. But there is an impact on the European country carrier. It sees the passenger numbers decline, as well as the revenues it earns in the market, minus 22%. So these generalized travel cost calculations can be used to simply calculate your consumer welfare impact. And when we do that, I think that there are three important issues to consider. The first, that is is one that I already mentioned, that it is a networked industry. So, especially on long-haul markets, 
There are direct travel options, non-stop, Air France, Paris Charles de Gaulle to Singapore, and you have many indirect travel options, which should be included um, and assessed in such an analysis. Secondly, and I think that this one is very important when we look at policy interventions, is the level of pass-through. When a government, for example, would introduce an aviation tax, the question is to what extent the suppliers in the market pass through that cost increase to the consumer. And in many studies we see that there is an assumption of 100% pass-through because it is assumed that the market is very competitive. But when we look at the individual markets worldwide, and colleagues of mine uh, have recently done research on that, um, some very thick markets are indeed very competitive, but the majority of markets worldwide has, um, is monopolistic or oligopolistic. And other assumptions regarding pass-through might be more appropriate. However, there's not much empirical research on the level of pass-through. The way airlines pass through cost changes to uh, their final consumers. So this is definitely an area where there needs to be more research because I think it influences um, the results regarding consumer welfare impacts and in total in the CBA significantly. So at least sensitivity analysis is required here. A third issue relates to airport capacity constraints. In Europe, airport capacity is increasingly scarce. There is research regarding the London airports that because demand for airport capacity in the London area is larger than, than the capacity, um, passengers pay more, uh, all other things being equal, for their tickets than elsewhere in Europe. So there might arise scarcity rents when demand uh, starts to exceed supply. <laughs> so policy interventions that put caps on airport capacity might lead to, to higher fares. You would expect that airports clear the market when there is a shortage in airport capacity, uh, but normally they are regulated, so they don't have the freedom to increase their charges to equal demand and supply. And then the airlines uh, uh, do that, or other stakeholders in the chain, um, uh, resulting, uh, for example, in higher airfares for passengers. And if there are scarcity rents, in increases in costs might be absorbed by the airlines ex at the expense of the scarcity rents, instead of being passed through to passengers. So I think these are three issues that are very important to consider when we look at uh, consumer welfare um, the calculation of consumer welfare impact in aviation. But, what happens if airlines adjust capacity? So there's a certain policy intervention that impacts demand um, and your generalized travel cost. Uh, and we can evaluate that, we can assess that. However, airlines naturally react to changing demand and route profit profitabi profitability. And such, a, such supply reactions will again affect your travel costs in the market and demand and will change your initial calculations. And these supply reactions we think are important to consider because airline seat capacity is lumpy at various levels. So airlines find it quite difficult to, difficult to adjust capacity continuously to changing demand. And as Starkey and Yarrow put it, airline supply function is not a smooth function, but it is quite a discontinuous function. So again, when we look at this, this example of liberalization of an air route, what would be your result if that decrease in revenues for the European carrier would force the airline to cut frequencies or even to close the route. That would change your network, would change um, your generalized travel cost in the market and would change your calculation of your consumer welfare impacts. 
how airlines can adjust capacity in various ways. When there is less demand in the market, they can use smaller aircraft, for example. They can adjust the route frequency. They might close the route. They might even close entire bases. And when they operate a transfer hub, such as Lufthansa or KLM, or SAS at Copenhagen, they might rationalize the hub. But the flexibility for adjusting capacity is within the own is generally limited. Why? Um, regarding the fleet, regarding the aircraft they use, some airlines such as, Easy, such as EasyJet and Ryanair just have one aircraft type in their fleet. Network carriers such as Lufthansa and, and KLM have multiple aircraft in their fleet, uh, but they have commitments on other routes, so they can't, cannot just simply use a smaller aircraft when they're confronted with, uh, with lower demand. And what we also see, in particular for network carriers like KLM and Lufthansa, is that they operate minimum competitive. They need to operate minimum competitive frequencies. To be competitive in international markets, for a European route, you need at least two frequencies a day to serve well the business community, and for long haul routes, you need at least four, five, six frequencies um, uh, per week. And that means that the eventual impact on, on demand and welfare, when we take into account the supply effects, may be larger than we initially estimated. Or, as Starkey put it, elasticities at airport can be leveraged because of the lumpiness of airline seat capacity. Well, for particular Hub airports, we developed a model, it's a kind of simulation tool, to simulate airline responses and take into account, include part of the second order supply reactions. And what it does is, is, is quite simple. The first step is to assess the demand impacts. For example, to calculate the changes in demand due to the introduction of an aviation tax, of a policy intervention. And we use the net cost model for that, or the demand change might be exogenously given, might be provided from, a, from, a, from another source, for example. And then the hub network rationalization model simulates iteratively the supply reactions of the carrier when it's confronted with lower passenger demand. because the carrier is not going to wait and see uh, what happens with the passenger demand, it's going to try and restore passenger demand. It can do so by adjusting its fares. In a mon monopolistic market, it might be able to, to decrease its fares a bit. It might adjust frequencies, it might close routes, but when it closes a route, a new airline with lower cost levels might enter the market. So that H&R model also simulates new airline entry if it is feasible. And when a kind of stable situation is reached, the model estimates the impact on demand, on connectivity, on generalized travel cost and consumer welfare in comparison to a reference situation. Now we can use that H&R model for any airport, any airline, but it shows it real airport uh, at real value at hub airports, at transfer hubs. And why? Because the routes of a hub carrier at a hub are very interrelated. With one route, a hub carrier, such as KLM at Amsterdam, serves multiple markets. It combines the local origin destination flows and many transfer flows over the hub. So on the route between Amsterdam and Atlanta, KLM not only carries the passengers between Amsterdam and Atlanta, but also from Hamburg, Stockholm, um, Berlin, via Amsterdam to Atlanta. So it combines multiple markets. Now, if a hub carrier closes one route, for example, Amsterdam to Atlanta, it will affect the passenger feed on the Amsterdam to Hamburg route. And when the hub carrier is forced to close the Amsterdam to Hamburg route, it will affect the feed to its Seattle route. And when the, the Seattle route is closed, it would affect the, uh, the Amsterdam to Johannesburg passengers. So 
Traffic flows are very interrelated for those hub carriers and the hub network rationalization model takes that uh, into account. Frequency reductions, route closures at one route may affect passenger numbers at other routes. So let us go stepwise through that H&R model. Assume that we have a policy scenario, for example an airport charge increase, but it can be any policy intervention. Using assumptions on the level of pass-through in the net cost model, we have a kind of first-order demand effect. And for, let us take the hub, uh, hub carrier, the hub carrier at Amsterdam, KLM, the hub carrier will be confronted with lower load factors. But it will react to those load factors. Are the load factors below a critical level? Well, when they're not, the airline can still profitably operate the route, no further action is required. But if yes, well, the airline might try to restore its load factors by adjusting price, by attracting more passengers, and by getting its load factor again uh, above its minimum level. There will be uh, much limitations to that. If the load factor is still below the critical level, um, it might decide to reduce frequency. If load factors are not below the, uh, below the critical level, no further action is required, and there is a certain demand and revenue loss, and we have a kind of stable situation. If not, the airline might decide to reduce its frequencies. But as I said, what we see in international markets is that airlines tend to operate as kind of minimum competitive frequency, especially the network areas. If the frequency is not below its minimum, uh, there's no additional frequency reduction needed. If it gets below, uh, below minimum competitive frequency, the airline might decide to close the route. But we're talking about a hub carrier, such as KLM. So closure of a route and frequency reductions might affect transfer demand to other routes in a network. And when the closure of the Amsterdam to Atlanta route affects passenger demand on the Amsterdam to Hamburg route, there will be lower load factors on the Amsterdam to Hamburg route as well, and we go into the scheme again. So we iterate through this process until a stable situation in the network of the hub carrier um, is reached. And when that stable situation is reached, we calculate again consumer welfare impacts in comparison to a reference scenario. To further illustrate what I mean, um, this is a picture from a number of years ago, and these sh th this picture shows the transfer relations in of the Amsterdam to Detroit route operated by KLM and Delta. And we see that Detroit feeds about 20% of its passengers to Mumbai, 15% of its passengers to Hyderabad, and 13% of its passengers to Prague. And the Prague route itself uh, feeds 0.5 passengers to Washington, and the Washington route feeds 6% of its passengers to Doha. So the traffic flows within and the routes within a hub-and-spoke network are very much interrelated. So when you close one route, it will have effects on other routes as well. Oh. Somehow... One of my slides disappeared. Anyway, um, when we look at, um, at, at the slides, can I take one? Okay, you can see it at the back, can't you? Okay. <laughs> um, I was going to talk about this one because the question is how robust is um, such a hub network? how uh, robust is uh, such a hub network. And using the hub network rationalization model, what we did for KLM at Amsterdam is reduce stepwise the number of transfer passengers in the network. And 5%, 10%, 20%, 30% less transfer passengers, 
And what we, what we conclude is that uh, the, the hub network is quite robust for a reduction in transfer demand up to a certain level. But beyond a certain level, the network starts to collapse. Because if there's not enough transfer demand on Amsterdam, Detroit and Amsterdam, Atlanta, uh, it will finally lead to the closure of the Hamburg route and the Berlin route and the Trondheim route. And that will affect, again, the Johannesburg route and the Washington route. Um, so from a reduction of 30 to 40 percent transfer traffic, then the, uh, um, the hub network basically starts to collapse and we have a kind of domino effect. I think I'm okay. okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Okay. So, the hub network rationalization model can be used to simulate supply reactions of a carrier and preferably, um, uh, and especially um, a hub carrier. Um, by simulating its fare reactions, uh, its uh, frequency adjustments, and route closures. To, to illustrate the application of that hub, uh, 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 network rationalization model, we applied it to, um, to Amsterdam. Um, and we assumed a rationalization of the KLM and SkyTeam hub at Amsterdam to calculate the network impacts and the welfare impacts of, of a hypothetical rationalization of the SkyTeam network at Amsterdam. We did so in, in many scenarios, and I take the most extreme one uh, in this presentation, which is the non-hub scenario. So we assume that the hub carrier and partners decide to close the entire hub operation at Amsterdam, so that the remaining network is mainly supported by the local traffic and not anymore by transfer traffic. New airlines may enter the market and using the HNR model, what network will remain and what are the consumer welfare impacts in comparison to the current network. You could also take a future situation, but let's keep it simple, in comparison to the current network. So we did the exercise and we looked first of all of what would happen with a network in a non-hub scenario when we think away the transfer traffic of KLM at Amsterdam airport. And we looked at the, at the European network. And we see a lot of dots which are the European destinations of KLM and SkyTeam partners. Um, the green ones are the unaffected destinations. The red ones are the destinations of SkyTeam that are expected to be cancelled. The yellow ones, the destinations still served by other airlines, competing airlines of SkyTeam. And at the orange ones, SkyTeam is still operating, but with a decreased frequency. And what do we see? Well, we see that there are many destinations that see a SkyTeam route closure, but destinations are still served by other airlines. So apart from some smaller destinations such as Bremen and Hanover and here in Norway and, and, and uh, uh, Sweden, um, the European network seems to remain quite intact, albeit with less competition and with less frequencies. And that is what we see in empirically in the hubbing cases, where an airport loses its hub function, Milan Malpensa, Barcelona, that lost their transfer function, that the European network tends to remain quite intact because there's a larger local demand on those routes. However, for the intercontinental network at Amsterdam, the situation would be quite different. At the intercontinental KLM routes, about 70% of the passengers are transfer passengers. They're not going to the Netherlands, not coming from the Netherlands, they're just making their transfer at Amsterdam. And because of this high percentage in such a non-hub scenario, you would lose quite a lot of destinations, 
and at the root at, at the roots that see a closure of the SkyTeam operation, the likelihood of new airlines entering is not that high. Why not? Because you need to operate those routes profitably a lot of transfer passengers, and those airlines do not operate a hub at Amsterdam. And secondly, you m there might be bilateral restrictions. It's more costly to operate a long haul route. So we see quite some route cancellations, the red dots here in Latin America, but also Africa um, and Asia, if you would think away that hub operation of KLM, even when you take into account potential new airline entry. Well, and when you put that in a table, what you, uh, wh what you see is that um, the number of weekly flights, the total number of weekly flights would uh, decrease in the scenario about, uh, by about 40%, both on the European side and the intercontinental side. So average flight frequencies on routes are going down, but the number of European destinations only decreases by minus 6%, so the European network remains quite intact. The number of intercontinental routes, however, decreases by almost 30%. So, let's say the connectivity damage for the intercontinental network is much larger than for the uh, European network. Well, when we use that network that remains, as we estimated it with the hub network rationalization model, we can estimate the welfare changes, um, the consumer welfare changes in comparison to the current network. And we can break that down in a fair and competition element. Because if uh, SkyTeam closes a number of routes, the, 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 the competition at the various markets affected will change, and the net effect is negative. So um, there will be less competition on a number of markets. There's a connectivity effect, and there is a land side access cost. Because if you can't travel anymore to, to, uh, to your destination from Amsterdam, you might choose another departure airport in the catchment area. You might go to Brussels, take your flight there. You might travel to Frankfurt, take your flight there. Or Rotterdam Airport, small regional airport in the Netherlands, take a connecting flight via uh, Munich to your final destination, for example. And we estimated that in the first year that uh, consumer welfare impact of almost minus 600 million euro in the non-hub scenario. I come to the conclusions and policy uh, recommendations. Using standard transport model formulations, we can very well estimate first order consumer welfare impacts in air transport. However, I think it's important to note that airline seat capacity is, is lumpy and that airlines find it difficult to adjust capacity continuously to changing demand. And especially at the individual market level, individual airport level, um, the lumpiness can leverage your initial elasticities, your initial demand effects and consumer welfare impacts. And in particular at hub airports, rationalization of an airline network can eventually re result in kind of domino effect, a cascade effect, although hubs are quite robust up to a certain level. And the H&R model simulates airline responses as a result of decreasing uh, demand. And as such, it includes part of those second order effects. Certainly not all. When we come back to the Ryanair example, Ryanair decided to close its Ruge base. But was it because it, is it because its load factors would drop below a critical level or that its Ruge operation would not be profitable at all? I guess not. I think that it can use its aircraft <laughs> more profitably elsewhere in its network. So there's the question of opportunity uh, cost, and it might also be a pressure instrument to, to the Norwegian government. So um, these uncertainties are, of course, not covered by the H&R um, model. 
My main message, policymakers and regulators should take into account the uncertainties and the risk of potential second order supply impacts. Um, the applications of such an approach are numerous. You can think of the deregulation of aviation markets, impacts of greater airline competition, the introduction of air travel taxes, but also changes in airport charges, ATC costs, and security costs. Um, so that we're at least better aware of the potential second order uh, impacts and preferably quantify them. Thank you.